And I want to say thanks to John and Dawn, and also to the leaders here of Lifeline Church, and also community. We thank God for what he's doing at this time. I thank God for what he's doing in my life. I want to say that I'm still married to one wife. We are 30 years married, and we are following the footsteps of John, who is 40, and therefore we are trying to, we, we are trying to compete on that level, but we know we cannot reach him. However, we are glad to know that God is working in our lives and doing things around the world. And what a privilege it is to know that there are so many things that we can be involved in, but most importantly, to know that we are called of God to be, first of all, his children and to be a part of what he is doing, a part of his family. God has one big, big, big family. And we have a privilege to be part of that family. And it doesn't matter color or creed. It doesn't matter positions. God has chosen us and given us a part to be equally involved in his kingdom. And that's why we are grateful for that opportunity. John was sharing with you certain things that God has been using me to do around the Caribbean. And uh, I want to thank him for that. I believe it's an opportunity for every one of us to be able to pick up what God is really doing through the Holy Spirit. I believe the agent of the Godhead that is in operation in the earth today is the Holy Spirit. There was a time when the Father operated in creating, when he called everything into being, but he couldn't do that until or unless he depended on the Holy Spirit. God the Father had to depend on the Holy Spirit. The stars, the moon, the sky, the water, everything that you see is a result of God waiting for the Holy Spirit to move. If the Holy Spirit did not move upon conditions, nothing would happen. The Holy Spirit is very, very important, and God the Father, he needed the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 2, um, chapter 1 and verse 2, or verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth, everything wrong with it. Without form, void, dark. The earth has a problem. And God does not like it. But God is not in a place of panic. Most of us, when things is not going right for us, we panic. God never panicked. I believe it was a time when God began to consolidate and take the time to be able to prepare himself to wait because he's involved in teamwork. Everybody's a teamwork. That's why I'm happy to be here because I realize to be a part of Lifeline is not just one man. It is every one of us together. And I really want to thank God for, for John and Dawn, who has inspired me over the years from 1987, since we connected, up to now. We are in relationship, and the relationship goes stronger. I want you to really give God thanks for them. I want you to put your hands together and just thank God for that. I have been inspired to do much more because when I see the sacrifice that he made, he made sacrifices when his children were very little, 
and Dawn had to stay home to take care of them. And he comes to the beautiful Caribbean, which we call paradise, where the lovely waters are so close by that any time you say, oosh, you want to get close to it. And John would not take the time to step into the water. He would not sit on the beach like all the other tourists who come into our, our beautiful shores. John would be totally involved in building a relationship. And I, that got my attention. At times he would go to another country and he would call from that country and said, Hilton, I'm going to just pop into St. Martin and I just want to get some time. Are you there? I said, yes, I'm there. And we would take the time just to sit in the hotel. He would speak with us like a father speaking to children and we would build that kind of relationship. He didn't ask about, well, the church, I would like to come in to preach. And most of them, that's one of the things that we heard. We had heard people call in and says, I would like to come and have a week of, of crusade for you. I would like to come and have some meetings. They would never find out what was going on with us. They would not know exactly what was going on, but everybody was looking for a preaching opportunity. One of the things that we do find out is we'd go through conferences, and when you go to conferences, no matter what part of the country or whether in the United States, one of the things that you would see that most people do is looking for an opportunity for a preaching engagement. And therefore, you'd find most people have cards, and that's one of the things, if you ask me today, I don't have cards. They would like an address. They would like to, 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 to preach somewhere. They would like to go somewhere. But John never used that as an opportunity. He never, he came simple, just a simple message. And first, it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with your fellow men. And that, I can really say, that's one of the things which really uh, draw me into this relationship. Other persons who have connected, like Norma and Manu on St. Martin, we have that kind of bonding. And we look forward for the time when we could come together because we recognize that when we get together and we sit down, the Holy Spirit comes in the midst of us and there's so much that could be done. I want to say to us today, the Holy Spirit is a person. And most times we have problems to uh, operate with the Holy Spirit because we usually think of the Holy Spirit as a thing. We usually think of the Holy Spirit as just a force or we think of the Holy Spirit as an influence. And more so because the name is not so common like John and Don and Jesus and the Father God, we tend to think exactly, well, it is hard to think of the Holy Spirit as a person. But he is a person and he is the person of the Godhead that is operating in the earth today and we must build a relationship with him. So the father had an opportunity in creation to put everything that you are seeing to make them visible, but in order for that to happen, he had to depend on the Holy Spirit. When man got a problem, we know after, in, in creating man, I don't want to really take so much time on that, but as in creating man, he did not just allow things to just come just like that. The scripture says that he spoke to himself, and he says, let us. That means he's speaking to Tim. Let us make man in our own image and likeness, and let them have dominion. Genesis 1, 26. All right? Let us. So even in the point in creating man, he is communicating with the Jesus, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Teamwork. So when man has a problem, he has to depend on not just himself, but on team to fix the problem. So the very same thing that helped him to fix the problem when the earth had a problem, it was the Holy Spirit moving and then the release of the word, which was Jesus, is the very same thing that he was depending on to help to fix the problem that man was faced with. So man's problem, because man is flesh, he had to really be able to deal with the problem that was in the flesh of man. Therefore, the word says to us in, Gen in John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same 
The same was in the beginning with God. That word became flesh. That word, the name of the word, is Jesus. In order to fix up man's problem, Jesus, the word, had to become like man, and that's the only way that man's problem could be rectified, and that is through the word, which is Jesus. But before Jesus comes into the earth, in order for that to happen, the Holy Spirit had to come and overshadow somebody in the earth. Mary, chosen to carry the seed of God. The, the, the angel said to her, you are chosen of God to bring, forth a, to bring forth his son. She said, how can this thing be? Seeing I know of no man. The angel said, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And that's how Jesus Christ was born into the earth. By the power of the Holy Spirit. So he was born of the Holy Spirit. But then as he grew up, at the age 30, he comes to the river where John was baptizing people. And he comes to John and he says, John, I need you to baptize me. John stops him and says, hey, wait. I have need to be baptized of you because you have a baptism that you're about to baptize men with. And that baptism, I need that baptism. And you are coming to me to be baptized? Jesus said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. That's Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. And so the word says to us that John baptized Jesus. And it says in verse 16 and 17 of that same chapter, that they went down both in the water, and as soon as they came out of the water, the heavens were open, and a voice from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit depending upon him, descending upon him, and coming upon him, and resting upon him as a dove. And the voice from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to come upon him. Jesus, the Word of God, needed the Holy Spirit to come upon him in order to fix up the problem of man. And what was the problem that needed to be fixed? The sin. And Jesus Christ came and he went through the suffering that he went through, the crucifixion that he went through, was because of the sin of humanity. And the Bible says to us, he hung on that cross. It was the Holy Spirit that empowered him to go through the cross. But I want you to understand, before he moved on, he started his ministry, or after he was filled, the next thing happened in both Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. Both of these scriptures there is speaking and saying almost practically the same thing. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, Then was Jesus led by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit where? Into the wilderness. In other words, he was kicked into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He didn't just choose to go there. The Holy Spirit pushed him into that place. The wilderness is a place where you, you, there's no supermarket. There is, everything is dry. Everything, there's nothing working in the supermarket, in, in, the, in, in this, in that place, the desert. It's a place you had to be total dependence on Almighty God. And Jesus was in that place and he was hungry. And 40 days and 40 nights he fasted without food. And the tempter came to him. And said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But heaven just witnessed and says, this is my beloved son. But the tempter is coming and says, if truly you are the son, turn the stones into bread. And that happened to most of us. 
The enemy would come to you and say, you're not a believer. You're not a, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're not a child of God. You're not a part of the king. Why are you? And put so many thoughts in our mind and cause us to think that we are not good to be children, to be sons of God. There are most of us who go for different forms of anxiety because there are thoughts that the enemy would bring to our mind to tell us. The tempter comes to you to tell you that you are not good. You are not good enough. Look what you did yesterday. Point out all the mistakes. I want to say to you, it doesn't matter what you have done yesterday. Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for that. And when you would recognize that you have sinned before him and confess your sin to him, the Bible says to us, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that true? Isn't that good to know that he doesn't keep wrong? He doesn't keep no record of all wrong. But the devil, would, the, the, the tempter, would keep the record of the wrong just to cause us to walk in a position where we are dejected, we are hopeless and discouraged. But today we can change that. And so the word says to us that at that point, Jesus overcome him on three different fronts. I want you to understand, he did not take a walk on an escutcheon with the devil and go to the top of the pinnacle of the temple or go, went up on a hiking to one of the mountains. No, that's not how it happened. It was directly in the mind. A battle of thoughts. That's where the enemy fights us most of the time. It's in our mind. Well, that's where the battle is. The battleground, the battlefield for our work and our progress in God is in our mind. And that's why we need to use the word of God just as Jesus Christ and Knock it down, shoot it down, blow it off, explode it by using the word of God. And when we use the word of God and forcefully speak back to him, when the thoughts come in, we hit that back with the word of God. He has to leave us for a season. And the word says he left him for a season. But next verse says, when you look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, it says to us, Jesus returned with the spirit with the power of the Spirit. It's one thing to be filled with the Spirit. It's another thing to be led of the Spirit. It's another thing to overcome the devil and the word of, with the word of God by the Spirit. It's another thing to fast, to be led to a place of fasting by the Spirit. But there's another thing called to be empowered by the Spirit. So Jesus, you could be filled and still don't have power. You don't have power to blow a fly. But when you have overcome the devil, that's where you take power from his hands. When you have overcome by allowing the word of God to rule in your life, the only way you can overcome the devil is with the word of God. And when that happens, you receive power. And when you receive power, the word says to us in verse 18, not only was he empowered by the spirit, but in verse 18 of Luke Chapter 4, he found a place, when he went to the synagogue, he found a place in the scroll where it was written. He found a place on purpose. He didn't just read anything. He read something on purpose because he knew that it was a reality in his life. You should not just read anything in the word. You should make sure that the Holy Spirit is directing you to something that is going to be fulfilled in your life. Something that you're walking into. And therefore, he found that place. In that scroll. And it read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. There's a first message. There are people who are poor in spirit. And we, our first responsibility is to preach that message to them. There are those who have a broken heart to mend, to help to mend their broken hearts. Doctors and surgeons in the hospital cannot mend broken hearts. Broken heart is as a result of people who have been in love, in a relationship, and have been jilted. 
Someone broke their heart. Somebody left them. Someone maybe even promised them marriage. And then maybe even take them to a place and prepare them where they had their dresses. Or maybe they had their costumes ready for the marriage. And all of a sudden, drop them. That is a broken heart. That person cannot eat, cannot sleep, has a problem, can smoke all the cigarettes and drugs in the world, and that still cannot help them because the heart is plundered. That heart is broken. But when the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes, it comes upon you to help somebody, for help to restore somebody who is in that position where they have encountered a broken heart. And then it goes on to a place of deliverance. And that's what happened to the church over the years. The church have been preaching a one-sided message called salvation. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom message is a four. Four plan message. You must be deliverance. And most of the time, there are people who are still shackled by the enemy. And we put it under nice names called Attitudes. But it is demonic activities that need to be called out. And unless they are called out from the individual, that person continues to be harassed. That person continues to have different phase, up today, down tomorrow. That person is in that person's position where that person cannot continue overcoming. And that's one of the reasons why it's important for, their, for, the, for, for the kingdom message to be preached. Message of poverty to those who are poor. A message for those who have broken hearts. For those who are held captive by the enemy. And those who are blind. That they will receive healing. That's what the message is about. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when he comes in. So one, he was filled with the Spirit. Two, he was led by the Spirit. Three, he overcome the devil by the Spirit. Four, he fasted in the Spirit. Five, he received power of the Holy Spirit. Six, he is anointed by the Spirit. And when the anointing is upon you, then you are a worker. Many people are feeling they are not workers because there's another step, the anointing. And what is the anointing? The anointing in the Old Testament was when the oil was poured out on the kings, on the priests, and the prophets. That's how it was in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it has been replaced by the Holy Spirit himself that God is choosing to anoint not just kings and prophets and priests, but God has called every one of us who comes to Jesus Christ priests and kings in his sight. So look at the person next to you and say, you say, you're royalty. You are king. But not only that, if you're a king, how you become a king, you cannot be a king if there is no anointing. Anytime God wanted a king, God would either call on Samuel the prophet. It is the prophet who anoints the king. And he calls on Samuel and said, I want you to go and anoint Saul to be king. Samuel has a little problem. He said, God, if you anoint Samuel, if you anoint, if you anoint Saul, it means that the people have rejected you. Oh, and he's crying. God says, I want you to do this. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. And later on, when Saul obeyed the people, and fulfill their heart's desire by refusing to obey God. Anytime we disobey God, we fall into the sin of rebellion and witchcraft. Anytime we disobey God, we fall under the sin of rebellion. The spirit of rebellion and witchcraft comes upon us. Let me say that again. The spirit of rebellion and witchcraft comes upon us. Anytime you disobey the word of God, you open up to a tormenting spirit. Let me say that again. You open up to a tormenting spirit. And that's what happened. The word would say to us that a tormenting spirit came upon Saul. That David would have to come and play music to chase away that tormenting spirit, that evil spirit. 
And God said to Samuel, I want you to go and anoint David. Saul says, I don't understand God. This is confusion. You're sending me to anoint a king, another person in the place of a king who is still on the throne. God says, I want you to understand. Most times we don't understand what is lies and we don't understand the operation of the Holy Spirit. God did not lie. God told him something that I want you to understand. He said to Samuel, you don't have to tell the people you come to anoint a king. Tell the people you come to sacrifice. But when you, while you're doing the sacrifice, you are doing what I want. What is more important? What your, your opinion or God's will? And most times we have our opinion as to why the thing should happen this way. If we're accustomed of having it this way. But the point is the Holy Spirit wanted it to happen that way. And we better obey God rather than man. And so Saul is at the point he hears about it. He hears about it. And he's angry. But Samuel gets to the place and David is before him. Oh, sorry, you have six other men passed before. And he saw Chama, strapped muscle guy. He has a six pack. And he, and he walks by. And uh, when Samuel saw him, he said, Surely this man has to be the anointed one that God wants me, the man that God wants. God says, Hey, stop. You look on the outside. Men look on the outside appearance. But I look at the quality of the heart. He said, is there another one? Is there another one? It's, and even Jesse forgot he had another son. Sometimes when God is preparing you for something, people forget about you. And there at the back side of the desert, that's where David was. And David came and they called him in. The Bible says he was fair, but he was a rudy guy. He was a bold guy. I like bold guys. And the word says, he poured the oil on him. The oil representing the Holy Spirit. I want to say this to you today. The Holy Spirit was promised for every one of us to have. In the book of the major prophet called Isaiah, the scripture tells us about that prophecy that was made in chapter 28 and verse 11, where he said that there will be a speaking forth, and he's speaking of the, the, the forthcoming of that day of Pentecost, when there will be stammering lips that will precede the speaking in other tongues. And that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. The minor prophet Joel, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 and 29, where he says that God will pour his spirit upon all flesh. Not some, everybody say all. And if God is going to pour his spirit upon all flesh, that means everyone in this room. No one is excluded. And what will happen, your sons and daughters will prophesy. The old men shall see dream, then the dream, and the young men shall dream dreams. So one is going to dream dreams and see visions. The other one is going to be prophesying. And upon his servants and handmaiden, he will pour his spirit in those days, says the Lord. And this is the day in which we are. I want to say to us, the entire Bible that we have, everything is speaking about an experience with the Holy Spirit. Everyone. I started with God the Father having an experience with the Holy Spirit that bring about the creation. I speak about Jesus having an experience with the Holy Spirit that bring about the salvation of all humanity. But I could go on. I could look at Moses who had an experience when he stepped aside to see the burning bush, why he cannot understand in his amazement, why is it that this tree is on fire and it's not turning into ashes? It was a move of the Holy Spirit. 
We can go on further and we can look at David who experienced the supernatural power of God as the anointing of the Holy Spirit was poured upon his life and his life of worship. He was a praiser that operated in a fast forward time. He was living under, under the law, but everything that he did was contrary to what the law required. Why? Because he worshipped by revelation. And the revelation, he worshipped based on our time. So that's why you have, in the Old Testament, they couldn't worship openly. In the Old Testament, only the high priest had to go to the place of encounter with God in the Holy of Holies. Everybody else stayed outside. Only one person would do it, and he would do that once a year. And if he's qualified, he'd be, if, he's, if he's not qualified, he would be dead. They would have to pull him out. But I want you to understand, David, he danced before the act of the Lord. Never would that ever happen under the law. But because he had a revelation of the worship that was required of God, he worshiped based on the heart of God. He experienced the fullness of the Spirit. We can look at Ezekiel in the 37th chapter. God said, I have something to tell you. I like God. God has something to tell you. It's surprising to know exactly he's told him, I want you to go to the cemetery. But he knows if he tells him to go to the cemetery, he will not go because he'll say, oh, wow, that place. No. This place is a scary place. I don't want to go to that place. But I like what the scripture says. The Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord transported him that place. The Holy Spirit became the helicopter that takes him to that place. There are certain places we will not go until the Holy Spirit transports us into that position. And that's the ability of the Holy Spirit. He took him into that place. And there he showed him a valley where there is just skeleton. And everyone is scattered all over the place. And God said to him, can this bone live? And he said, only you know. And God said to him, what he should do to ensure that they can live. He said, prophesy. Look at the person next to you and say, prophesy. Some of us, we don't operate in the spirit because we don't understand prophesying. Prophesying is speaking something that you do not know, that you receive in the supernatural realm, that God is about to do, and you're speaking it in faith. Prophecy is done by faith. Tongues. The reason why many people are not speaking in tongues is because they're not speaking in tongues by faith. They want to talk, speak in tongues by understanding. I'm not understanding what I'm saying. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to make a fool of, well, yes, it means making a fool of yourself that even people would think that you're drunk. People think that you're crazy. That's what it was. In the, that's what happened in the book of Acts, chapter 2. People begin to question and say, these men are, these men are drunk. But Peter, that Peter had to stand up and say, these men are not drunk as you suppose. But this is what, this is fulfillment of what was spoken by the prophet Joel. That he would pour his spirit upon all flesh. So Ezekiel, He's in that place where he prophesies to the dry bones and bones all of a sudden, a rattling takes place within the valley and bones begin to run and jump over bones in order to be connect, reconnected. Sometimes you may be dry. God's spirit comes in for that very purpose just to cause you to be reconnected again. He comes in to empower you so that you would be able to reconnect. And some of you might be here even in this lifeline setting and you're disconnected. You do not know what is happening. You're disconnected at home. You're disconnected in your own job. You are not focused. But the Holy Spirit comes for that purpose just to empower you so that you would be able to reconnect. By just prophesying. And that's what I liked this morning when I heard 
that John said on Tuesday, sometimes we used to set aside some times for prayer on a certain Tuesday, the first Sunday, the first Tuesday of the month. I would like people to really bring it up. You see, I want you to understand that God wants you to keep on doing the thing that you've been doing because he's in the thing that you're doing at a time that you do not expect. That's the time that he is going to work in the middle of you. The Holy Spirit is just going to forcefully come in the midst of you and change certain situations. Just because you start one time and you didn't see results doesn't give you no credence to stop. And so, the bones, everything connected, but then they're still dead. God said, prophesied to the four winds and say to them, come and blow upon these slain. And he prophesied. You see, God is our mentor. God is never asking us to do something that he himself didn't do. When there, the earth was void, without form and dark, God prophesied over the earth. The bones are in this condition. God is teaching him how he could really get the, that situation to change. And how you get them to change is by prophesying. Some of you are not prophesying enough. Some of you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to fill you in such a way that you begin to get an aggression inside of you that rises up inside of you and says, enough is enough. You got to change. Some of you need to be able to set the situation. You might have some problems at home. It could be your children. It could be a financial problem. The first person to take authority over it is you. You need to stand up and stand against that condition. It could be your children who are sick at home. You're supposed to call. You call your wife or wife call the husband and you begin to say, today we are taking a step for Andrew. We are taking a step for John. We are agreeing today. We are taking this week. We will not eat. We will fast because we want to see a change in Andrew. We want to see a change in Jack. We want to see a change in Tom. We want to see a change in that situation. Even before you could call John, you should exercise your authority in the Holy Spirit. And then, we could go on further. Every part within the Bible, we could say. But there's two guys I want you to, to see in the Old Testament. Elisha. He's called a Tishbite. He has a, an anointing of God on him. He has fire on him. The anointing of God is fire that has a zeal inside and a passion for God. And he goes up to Ahab, a wicked king who is ruling over his city and his nation. And he said to him, I am prophesying over this nation that no rain is going to fall on this, is going to come upon this land for the next three and a half years. He prophesied and it, God honored his word. Let me say something to you. He didn't just prophesy like this. Most people think that Elijah just go up crazy and just start saying things. No, he found out in, Gen in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God said if the people would forsake him and disobey his word, then there will be no rain. It, the heaven will withhold rain. So he understood that principle. Then he stood before the king and he says, I usher it in today that no rain would continue to pour out upon your wickedness in this nation. That's why I said to you, Jesus purposely looked for a place where he could read and said, today, when he's finished reading, he said, today, this very scripture that I just read is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, it just leaped out of the pages, leaped out of the scroll, and it is in my life. Practical. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And you will see it happening. 
that those who are poor in spirit, they are being restored. Those who have broken hearts, they are being restored. Those who are blind are going to see. And did it happen? When we read our Bibles, isn't that true? Did it happen? Did it happen? Did the blind see? The lame, did they walk? Did the sick receive recovery? Yes. The very same thing God is asking us to do. But it depends on us having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So God said to the, so Jesus said to his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that was promised by the Holy Spirit. Do not go on your own. Wait for the promise of the Father. And therefore that was in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. But in verse 8, he said, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, first in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. That means London. But you had to wait to receive the power. If you don't have power, if you have no anointing, you cannot do anything. You cannot go. And that's one of the reasons why we have people dragging themselves is because they do not have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Where he empowers us. And that's why it's so important. Let me go back to Elisha, Elijah. And so Elijah, after he prophesied, nowhere there is rain, no water. The king started to send people everywhere to see exactly if they could get fine water. They couldn't find because everywhere, lakes are dried, rivers are dried, everything seems to run out. There was a servant who worked in his house by the name of Obadiah. I'm now in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. Chapter 18. Obadiah, when he saw how wicked the king and queen got, they were killing every man who prophesied. Every prophet, since you opened your mouth and your prophet, they would kill you, slaughter you. So it was not a nice way to live in a country where people were slaughtering you. But Obadiah, who was working for the king at that moment, he took them by fifties. He took a hundred of them and hid them in caves. So the king one day said to him, I want you to go. I want you to go one side of the, of, of the country and I'll go to the other side of the country to see if we get water to feed the animals, the donkeys and the mules, etc. But as he was going, he met, Obadiah met with Elijah. And Elijah said, he said to Elijah, are you Elijah? He said, yes, I'm Elijah. He said, the king have been searching for you, a wanted man. There is more than 10,000 pounds that is offered for your head. That's, my, that's only my theory. Huh? That's my theory. And he says, go. Elijah said to him, go and tell Ahab. Elijah is here. I'm going to say something here to you. That's verse number 12 of Chapter 18. Obadiah said to him, Are you crazy? The king has such everywhere for you. And every country he sent and find out your whereabouts, and they did not find you. He made an oath with them that they would make sure that if, in case he find them there, he'll destroy that city. And you are telling me to leave you here and go and tell Ahab, Elijah is here. I'm not leaving you out of my sight. Because when I come back to the spot where you are, the Holy Spirit, very important, would have lifted you up, taken you up, and transported you into another place. I, your servant, Fear God, and I am not going to allow this to happen at all. I don't want to leave you out of my sight at all. 
I want you to pick up something right here. Obadiah. Obadiah has an understanding of the operations of the Holy Spirit. That when you're in a certain place of distress, when you're in a certain situation, things is not working well for the team. When things is not going on and people are being muddled up in different situations that they focus, the, the things they focus on the, the, the accident or the incident and they stop advancing. The Spirit of the Lord, when they open up and allow the Holy Spirit of God to take control, the Holy Spirit has the ability to lift them. I'm speaking to somebody today. The Holy Spirit, in the middle of your situation, has the ability to lift you, to take you out from that environment and place you into another place. And that's what Obadiah picked up. He able to do that. And you know that's what he did to Elijah. Remember, it was Elijah who prophesied and said, no rain. But was it raining in Elijah's quarter? Yes. God had already sent him by a brook. And he had Pizza Hut. Domino Pizza. KFC. They got the secret as to how to transport, how to deliver fresh food. Hot food. That's where they get the idea. God first did it. God allowed, God allowed this raven, it's eating dead flesh, it's doing all this other stuff, but God used it to be the delivery man to bring food for his prophet that he would not die of hunger. I want to say to you, God has a way of bringing special delivery to you when you are in the spirit, when you're obedient to him, when you are walking with him, God has a way of allowing that to happen in your life. Are you understanding me today? But the Holy Spirit can lift you. I want to use a little illustration. This morning, when I walked out of the car as we drove into Mayfield, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to observe something. And I'm observing, I saw three children running from another car. I'm saying, what are you telling me, God? He said, just keep, just keep your focus a little. These three children happen to be Daniel's children. But the one in front is little Zachary. And he saw Nana and he saw Jess. He saw the grandparents. And these three children, as soon as they leave the car, they didn't wait for daddy's order. They rush towards them with anticipation. But what I notice about Zachary is that his hands, his hands is lifted. And when his hands is lifted, the next thing I observe is Grandma Dawn putting her hands around him and embracing him. But the next thing that she does, she lifts him up. And she speaks to him, he speaks to her, and is excited to be in her arms. The Lord said to me, that's what I want you to tell the people here at Lifeline, that just as Zachary would run with an open hand, with an eagerness to get in the hands of his grandmother and grandfather, his grandparents, is the very same way the Holy Spirit is waiting for you to lift your hands and run towards me and I will lift you up regardless to your situation. I'm able to lift you up and I'm able to embrace you and I'm able to give you more love. I'm able to shower you with faith. Everybody say lift. How many of you need a lift? A lift in the spirit. Lift it. Sometimes you struggle at home. One bill after another. 
one situation after another. And it drain you. You don't know which direction to turn. But the Holy Spirit can give you a lift right in the middle of the situation. You could join hands with your partner. You can join hands with your partner and say, you know, we struggle in that area. We struggle in that thing. This thing was difficult for us. But we, let's agree together and let the Holy Spirit come in the middle of your situation as you join hands together and let him lift you. The last illustration I'm using is the other. The follow suit of, the, of Elijah. Elijah after he has brought Israel to the Mount of Carmel, he's seen a miraculous move of God. God answers by fire. He gets to a place of discouragement. I'm speaking to some people who are in that phase here today. He got to a place of discouragement. I'm speaking about the man who just saw fire coming down from heaven, who just received an answer to prayer. In less than two minutes, he said, God, show up. An answer. Let people know that you're God. I don't even need a long prayer. Soup, sap in. The anointing of the, the spirit. Sap into that, that, that altar. And the fire. Catch the sacrifice. And then there was water around that place. It dried. It dried up the water. And the people recognized the power of God on him. And he killed all 850 false prophets, both of Jezebel and also that of Baal. And then the news on BBC read for him. Tomorrow at this time, Mr. Elijah, because you've destroyed all these other prophets, I, Jezebel, I'm coming for you. For you. He ran. He ran in discouragement a whole day without God. And he's under this Jupiter tree. And he's saying, oh, God asking him, what are you doing there? Sometimes when discourage us, men hit us, we get to a position that God did not order us to go. Sometimes when we get into trouble, we get into a certain position and God is not satisfied with where we are. And God comes to him. The angel of the Lord comes to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing there? He said, I'm zealous for you, God. They have slain all the prophets. Destroyed them. And only me alone, I alone, poor me, poor me, only me alone. He entered into a place of self-pity. He got into a point of self-rejection. He gets into the point and says, nobody loves me. Only me alone there. Only alone in this situation. How many times have you fought that way? How many think that you alone are battling that situation and nobody cares for you? Nobody wants you. Nobody can reach out to you. And you're in that place where you're hidden. You're withdrawn yourself. You don't want to communicate with nobody. You don't want to speak to nobody. You're hiding. You're in a place of hiding. You want to hide. You even want to banish. You, want to ban you don't want to even come where lifeline meets anymore. You don't want to be in that place because you are in a place of disaster. You're saying to yourself, I am not good to myself. I will not be good to them. And you reject yourself. And that's Elijah. I'm speaking about a mighty prophet of God who would ex experience the move of God in a supernatural way. He understands the power of the Holy Spirit. But not because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there are no days that you will not go through discouragement. But you still need the Holy Spirit to refill you. It's like you were driving today, and you went up to two and three trips across to London, and you come back and forth. One of the next things that you have to do, if you do not pass through the gasoline station for a refilling, you will have to run with a bottle in your hands. I need some gas to pour in my car so that I will move again. I want to say to you, some of you are in that place where you need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. You have been used what you have, but you have not gone back to the refilling station for a long time. You need to get to that place again. And that was Elijah. And God said to him, Elijah, he said to God, I want to die. God, kill me. Now, do you really believe that Elijah wanted to die? If Elijah wanted to die, he would stay right there and let 
Jezebel kill him. At least he's not committing suicide. But he goes to God and says, God, I want you to kill me. But God didn't do you anything wrong. It was not God who led you to that place. But I said, God, I want you to kill me. God said, okay. I will release you of that position. But you have three things you need to do for me. I want you. Pick up yourself. Go back. Anoint three men. Two, I want you to anoint as king. But one, by the name of Elijah, the son of Sabbath, he is in an industry of cattle. He has 12 yokes of cattle that is working in a field. And he is on number 12. That's, God is specific. God, I say God is specific. He knows everybody, at the, no matter which part of the, the globe or no part, what part of the country where we are, God knows us. He knows whatever place in your home you are, God knows everything about you. And he said, him, I want you to call and prepare him to take you up to replace you. I want, something, I want to say something to you. You should not resign from your position. Not until you are sure you have somebody who can replace you. If you have not prepared somebody to replace you, you still is responsible for the position that you have. You cannot be replaced if you didn't prepare somebody. And like Jesus, Moses prepared one. So Moses could go. God, God could take Moses. But he had Joshua. Joshua, his assistant. But Jesus, understand the secret. Jesus did not have assistant. Jesus prepared 12. That when he leaves, he says, the things that I'm doing, greater things than these, shall you do because I go to my father. And like John, he didn't just prepare himself. I am. He prepared me. He has Norma. He has Jones. Are you hearing me? He has people in this room. He has Daniel. Isn't that true? He has some of the ladies who have beautiful testimonies of how God has worked. You have seen God work in your life, in this ministry, in this time, not just in a Bible, but you can point and identify of the power of the Spirit of God that operates in your own life where you have seen the supernatural works. It's not just a story we are saying, but we can say, yes, I'm a witness of the Spirit of God in operation today. And the word says, That Elijah, he went, he got Elisha. Ten years Elijah is with him. All Elisha did was just to observe the man. The greatest, assign, the greatest thing that he ever did for him was to pour water on his hands. He didn't blow a fly. He didn't do anything. All we knew about Elisha is that he walked with the man. And the time came when he's about to be offered he said to Elisha, Elisha, stay in this country. Stay in Jericho because God has called me to go on to Jordan. Elijah says, as long as I live, my soul live, I'll never leave you. I'm following you. I'm with you. He gets to Jordan. He says, stay here. The same thing until he reached to the last city. Determination. Commitment. Everybody said determination. Commitment. Determination to finish what God has given to you. I'm speaking to life and church today to say to you, the Spirit of the Lord is with you to cause you to be determined to finish that which he has given to you to do. And he says, when he got to the last city, he said to him, now that you're there, ask what you will that I should give to you, that I should do unto you. Elisha said, I want 
The last thing I want you to do for me, I want a double portion of the anointing of the spirit that is on your life. Wow. Wow. How many of you would like a double of what John has? How many of you would like, you've seen him operate it, but you'd like to have twice as much as he has to do? You think Elijah is going to say, wow, that's very good. That's easy for me to do for you. He said, you ask a hard thing. Thank you. You ask a hard thing. I want to say to you, when the Holy Spirit has opened your heart to the move of God, never ask for nothing easy. Always ask for hard, difficult thing. Because when God gives you the difficult thing, you will be able to bring glory to Almighty God. I'll tell you, he got it. Elijah, according to history, had 16 miracles in his lifetime. Elisha had a double of that. He had 32. And the last one occurred in chapter 13 of 2 Kings. Where he himself was dead. And they threw, a, when they saw a band of soldiers of army come in, they did not then bury the dead man. They threw him in Elisha's grave. And when the dead body touched the bones of Elisha, the dead body started running. I'm saying to you, you need an anointing that surpasses your life. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit that even when you die, there's still fire in your boats. There's still an aggression. There is still a boldness. There is still a legacy that you leave behind even after you are finished. But I'll close with this last thing. And it's an illustration. And I'll entitle that part, Hit It. I say, Hit It. Look at the person next to you and say, Hit It. Again, Hit It. Hit It. If you can use your foot, hit the ground. This is a prophetic operation. There are some things that you need to have in mind while you're hitting. Maybe it could be your marriage that is in problems. You, husbands and wife, can you agree together and hit it? Hit it, hit it. That means you're going to come together again and say, this marriage shall not go under. This marriage shall not fail. This marriage is gonna be an overcomer. Could be your education. You need to hit for your education. It could be a job, it could be a career, it could be some loved one that you're trying to win to Christ. But then all of a sudden you see that they're getting bitter and they do not want to hear about Jesus. You need to hit it. You need to hit it. You need to hit it. And this is found there in 2 Kings 13, verse 14. I'll just read it. I don't have time to open that because we are already beyond our time. It says, when Elisha became sick, 
with the illness that he died from, Jehoash, a wicked king of Israel, went down and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots and husband of God. That is powerful right there. He looked at his state and he's cried. Remember, he's in, in a place where it is his last laugh. He's in a place where he's about to die. And here it is when the king sees him. The king is shocked. The king cannot understand what has happened to this man. Every great man at one time in their life will go through sickness and they will go through even, some of them would even die. And that happens to every one of us, even if we could see the power of God move in a great way. Amen? I want you to understand that. And then, I want you to notice what he says. And Elijah said unto him, in his weakness, he said, take bow and arrow. And he took unto him bow and arrow, and he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hands upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hand, and he said, open the window, Iswad. And he opened it, then Elijah said, shoot. And he shot, and he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Apex till thou have consumed them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said unto the king, smite upon the ground or hit the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was rough with him and said, thou should have smitten five or six times. Then thou, then thou smite Syria till thou shalt consume it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but three times, and Elisha died. Only one opportunity that you have. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you are responsible. The king is responsible for one nation. He has great responsibility to defend. He is the general of war. But here... He's calling him a name that himself does not realize is valid. He's crying because he's, he's not crying because he's a close friend. He's not crying because he's a brother. He's not crying because he's a relative. He's not crying in that case. He's crying because he knows that Elisha, Elisha is a protection more than the armies of Israel. Elijah is better than the Amish because with him is the, the host of God. And he's about to die. But Elijah, in his last opportunity, he's not concerned about his own death and his sickness. He takes that last moment of his life over oh, the time. To prophesy to the man and said to him, I want you to get a bow and arrow. And I want you to take this bow and arrow. I want you to open the window. But I want you to allow my hand to be on your hand as you shoot through the window. And as you shoot through the window, that open window, I'm going to prophesy. And he prophesied and said, shoot. This is your deliverance. The deliverance for Israel and deliverance from Syria's bondage. Then the rest of the arrows, he told him to take it. He gives it to him and he says, here, strike the ground. Strike the ground with it. This is a prophetic move. He's in the presence of the prophet and he missed it completely. Lifeline Church, you have the anointing of God in your midst and you can miss it when you don't understand and you do not see. Unless the Holy Spirit, you get connected with him, you will not even understand who you have, 
who are the persons that are working with you. You will not even appreciate the persons that you have, that you'll treat them anyhow, and you will fail to take responsibility. But I want to say to you whether you are a father today, you are the husband of your wife and children, you are responsible to hit. But sometimes you only hit three times, and you don't have it. But you need, you need to, you need again. Not once, not twice, not three times, but hit it ferociously. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Four. Can I see some people make some action? No matter what your situation is, hit it. I want you to hit it. 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 It's for your marriage. Hit it. For your children. Hit it. I want you to hit it. It could be for a project. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. There might be some confusion at home. And you stop hitting. You say, Pastor, I've tried. Hilton, I've tried. I've, I, I cannot do it again. But I'm saying to you, you can. The Holy Spirit is asking you to hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it. Now's the time for him to work in your life. Because just as he operated on Elisha, Elijah, Jesus, God the Father, his presence is here.